Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, so today I want to talk about by Badiou, a French philosopher, and there is a very good documentary on YouTube. I just transcribed it. It is about something that is and that he calls an event. An event is a cut, an unpredictable event, the source of truths. Uh, it breaks with the paradigm that we had and there is no continuation. And uh, it's an interesting documentary. So everybody gets an event, right? Um, so I would, I would uh, recommend it. There's also a German channel where they interview Badieu, where he explains a little bit about his uh, theory of how we are somehow stuck in older theories and how we need new events that promise kind of new beginning in our tradition. But without further ado, I would say, let's go right into his text, um, which is called Being and Event. And I admit, I have only read a little so far, and I would suggest that we go the normal path and we try to read it together again. So let's, see, let's look at the table of content first to see what it is about being multiple and void. So yeah, the multiple is opposed to the one. I guess that is what he's discussing here. He also says the one and the multiple. Um, I suggest we just dive immediately into it and skip the table of content. You see it has many, many pages. So a lot for lonely nights to ponder upon when your girlfriend <laughs> has left you or you figure out that your dream girlfriend just does not exist because we are lonely on this planet. Okay, so we don't have to read the author's preface, I guess. Um, maybe interesting, there's also a translator's preface. It's obviously written in French, but uh, yeah, let's go to the end. I would like to start with being as multiple, but let's start with the introduction, okay? So let me get my highlighters. And let's start. Okay, so as far as I understand Lacan, he analyzes three significant streams of philosophy that we have at our time that all look in a very different way at our history. So to him, Heidegger is the last universally recognizable philosophers. Uh, so he's somehow still related to the tradition of philosophers who want to deal with the question of being, why the programs of America are not called philosophies anymore, but are yeah, subscribed to a certain um, idea of developing a mathematical language. It's, it's a program in order to um, rationalize the phenomena that surround us. And then we have also third, a post-Cartesian doctrine of the subject, which I don't really understand what that means, uh, but he somehow relates it to names like Marx, Lenin, Freud, and Lacan. And then he says uh, that the re regime of these interpretations is complicated by clinical or militant, militant operations which go beyond transmissible discourse. I guess he means here real social struggle where people fight with each other. So, in other words, we have uh, three philosophical attitudes in our time. We have, on the one hand, a really, I wouldn't say academic, but a real philosopher who understands himself in the great tradition of philosophers. Then we have a programmatic uh, scientific attitude that works towards mathematizing, mathematizing our time. And then we also have the revolutions. Uh, so he asks, okay, what do all of these three streams have in common? Well, he says they all want to be conclusions to an epoch that was before. Uh, for Heidegger, uh, this uh, epoch is cr criticized by uh, or criticized through his term of forgetting. They forget the idea of being and he wants to return to the Greek idea of being by destroying our metaphysics. He writes deconstructing, but 
Heidegger writes in German really zerstören, destroy, right? Uh, then the analytic current, however, says that all these philosophical positions, they make too many presuppositions. For example, they presuppose metaphysical objects like being, and that is senseless, which is probably true for the early um, analytic philosophy. The later philosophy is much more open, right? And um, yeah, so they, they say that these are limited to language games. And then, of course, we have the Marxian philosophies that are very practical and they technically say that theory is useless. What matters is to change the world. Okay, so we have these uh, three ideas. And yeah, obviously we have here a disparity between these statements. Um, for example, Heidegger sees that the paradigmatic position of science that is expressed in analytic philosophy is ultimately uh, nihilistic. Yeah, uh, It destroys the value of being, it makes everything calculable and cannot see beyond what is the real reason for why we do philosophy. Uh, then, of course, if we look at Marx and uh, Freud, they have different ideals uh, where, let's, let's read it here. Um, Whilst Freud and Marx conserve its ideals and Lacan himself rebuilds a basis for math themes by using logic and topology. The idea of an emancipation or of a salvation is proposed by Marx and Lenin in the guise of social revolution, but considered by Freud or Lacan with pessimistic skepticism and envisaged, em, envisaged, envisaged, I cannot say that word, I always forget how you pronounce that in English, by Heidegger in the retroactive anticipation of a return of the gods. Uh, so they have all a different idea of how the not of being and non-being and thought, which is the central topic maybe of philosophy, should be solved. And he says, well, obviously, in the confrontation of these three philosophies, we see that the time of thought is open to a different regime of understanding. And this opening can come in three forms. It is either a revolution, like in Marx, a return, like in Heidegger, or a critique of the former forms of philosophy as senseless in the analytic philosophy. And now he comes to his own position. So yeah, what is his own position? Well, he believes that with Heidegger, the ontological question, the question of being, what is being for real, uh, that's still relevant. Uh, but we can rephrase it with the revolutionary concepts of analytic philosophy, borrowed from Frege and Cantor, that give new orientations in the space for thought. And then we also see, however, with Freud and Lacan, that this conceptual apparatus is still not entirely enough um, because we also need a practical orientation towards a subject that lives in the realm of practice. So he wants to combine these three new theories and I guess he has a new proposition to make a new idea of how philosophy should be done. Now, in the next step, Badiou tr tries to um, understand his thought in terms of the historical periods. He says there we have some entangled periods and he tries to um, explain and which historical position we find ourselves, although we live in a complex and indeed confused epoch that is characterized by ruptures and continuities. So what is the first periodization that he sees? It is what he calls the third epoch of science that comes after the Greek revolution of introducing truth and literacy to our discourses, I believe, and the Galilean interpretation, which probably Kant would rather describe as the Copernican turn. Nevertheless, what has to come now is neither a new invention, as we have seen maybe with the Greek, 
or a break with the classical paradigms as we have seen in Galilee, which was a submission to the technique of observation, empiricism, but rather a split where he writes through which the very nature of the base of mathematical rationalities, rationality reveals itself as does the character of the decision of thought which establishes it. So I think he believes, how I see it, that ontology should be done in a way that we see the world as mathematical for some reason. So he seems to commit to mathematics, while the commitment to mathematics is, according to how I understand him, a truly revolutionary act, um, which um, confirms the decision of the subject. Now that is a little bit of interpretation. I may be wrong on that, right? Uh, so, and then he has a second periodization where he says, and this is what I found very interesting, that's why I marked it as green, that we are equally the contemporaries of a second epoch of the doctrine of the subject. So the subject becomes a very important factor in this second scientific revolution. And it is the first revolution where the relationship between subject and object gets reversed. So before we thought that the object actually only influences the subject, but now we say that the subject somehow is involved in the construction of the object, which even goes so far that we get theories of, for example, I believe Donald Hoffman, who believes a kind of panpsychism, who believes consciousness is first and space-time is irrational. But this is just a scientific perspective. I think this is a speculative tendency, but we have to take that seriously. And I think for epistemology, such a perspective is very meaningful. So he says it is no longer the founding subject centered and reflective whose theme runs from Descartes to Hegel and which remains legible in Marx and Freud. That is what I have just explained. Subject is center of the construction of the world. But now we somehow change it. So the contemporary subject is void, cleaved, asubstantial and irreflexive. Moreover, one can only suppose its existence in the context of particular processes whose conditions are rigorous. So the way he characterizes the contemporary subject is not that he denies it after the second revolution, but it seems he says, if we really go into ourselves, if we start this journey into this inner self, which so many psychologists have demanded at the beginning of the 20th century, then we just end up in a mission to Solaris, a ininterpretable planet, a rich realm that reveals nothing to us, just new phenomena and infinity towards the inside, an endlessly divisible space of meaninglessness. Nevertheless, grasping this kind of nothing, that is what he says, can only be done in a rigorous way. So it should not be done in this intuitive way that we all throw some mushrooms and then say, now I have it. Om, om, om. So why is it rigorous? He owes us some answers. These seem just to be some suggestions or some proposals of what he plans to do. So and then he has a third periodization. So we see before we had three phases, then we had two phases of the subject and now we are the contemporaries of a new departure in the doctrine of truth. So we find a new truth that actually dissolves the original relationship between knowledge and truth. So truth is less based on knowledge, I guess, about the external world, or I wonder, I really wonder what he means by that. So that's a bit of a question here, right? Um, so let's, let's read a little bit further. Um, so he, he calls the old forms veracity 
and he believes that the new path of truth or the new theme of truth also crosses the path of Heidegger. Um, but yeah, what do he want wants to do? I don't know, right? Um, the mathematicians who broke with the object at the end of the last century, just as they broke with adequation and the modern theories of the subject, which deplaced truth from its subjective pronunciation. So there's a new idea of truth and somehow this new departure was already initiated by Heidegger, the mathematicians, and I guess the psychologists, right? What did Heidegger do? Well, he uh, subtracted truth from knowledge. Yeah, that's aletheia, that which is open and opening, where we stand in the open. Uh, then the mathematicians who somehow reject the idea of an adequation, that the world is mathematical, the world is truly beautiful. You know, it may be, it may be ugly, but mathematics may be beautiful. Uh, or that they don't say mathematics needs a, a real object. We can also deal with entirely abstract thought entities. Maybe he means that. And then we also have the modern theories of the subject that somehow say that truth in itself is objective. I wonder what that means. So this is what he has in mind. Uh, and he says uh, it follows... Uh, yeah, what follows from it. So I don't think that he is yet very clear what he plans to do. So the science of being qua being has existed since the Greeks, such as the sense and status of mathematics. However, it is only that we have the means to know this. Uh, to know what? The science of being. So he says, now we come truly to a science of being. Uh, it follows from my thesis that philosophy is not centered on ontology which exists as a separate and exact discipline. Rather, it circulates between this ontology, the modern theories of the subject, and its own history. So I think what he wants to say is that the locus of philosophy is not an ontology, as Heidegger has assumed. It circulates between these three ideas that he has introduced, ontology, mathematics and a theory of the subject. I still don't really have an idea what he means, but at least it sounds interesting. And then he says, what philosophy must do is propose a conceptual framework in which the contemporary composability of these conditions can be grasped. So we want to now have a framework in which we can compress all of these three different strains and then truly have, I guess, an event and a new epoch. Um, philosophy can only do this if it frees itself from its foundational ambition um, and by designating amongst its own condition as a singular device discursive situation. Oh wait, I have to read that again. Philosophy can only do this and this is what frees it from any foundational ambition in which it would lose itself by designating amongst its own condition as a singular discursive situation ontology itself in the form of pure mathematics. We need math. That's what he says. We need math. Math is the truth. Math is the truth. What do you think? Is that interesting? Well, it will be an interesting sort of math that Badiou will propose. Uh, so please let me know in the comments if you want to see the um, documentary, which I recommend. He speaks a lot in English, then you'll find that in the description. Otherwise, like the video, share and subscribe. Thank you. Bye-bye.